Now, on to the next part of the show, the spaghetti tree and other actual fake news. I want to make it very loud and proud to bring on stage Amy Wilson. Hi, darlings. How are we this evening? How are we doing over by the bar over there? Are we having fun yet? Uh, my name is Amy Widowson, and today I'm going to be speaking on... I'm going to not break the microphone. I'm going to be speaking on that fake news that was uh, just uh, recently uh, discussed. M media. So on April 1st, 1957, viewers of the BBC news program Panorama were treated with views of a remote mountain town as a farming family in the south of Switzerland gently tended to their crop. The harvest was good. High in the slopes above Lake Lugano, on the border of Switzerland and Italy, we learned that this year's bounty could be credited to milder winters and other fortuitous circumstances. In fact, this mild winter had caused flowers to bloom a fortnight early. In the film, Bursts of blossoms frame a family lovingly reaping what they've sown. Finally, we join this family as they sit down to a meal that they grew, made with ingredients, quote, so brought fresh from garden to table at the very peak of condition, unquote. And you know what that harvest was? It was a fucking spaghetti tree is what it was. <laughs> so yeah, that's right, that's a spaghetti tree and the BBC ran a two and a half minute spot on it as a joke in 1957. This was a very real thing that the British Broadcasting Corporation aired in 1957 on television in what was the first time the medium was used to broadcast, there we go, was used to broadcast an April Fool's Day hoax. According to the excellent Museum of Hoaxes website, the whole scheme was concocted end-to-end -end by a puckish Austrian cameraman named Charles de Jaeger. Supposedly, the idea came to him when he was in his school days, during which a teacher had once said, quote, Boys, you are so stupid, you'd believe me if I told you that spaghetti grew on trees. So remember, childhood trauma can go national? I don't know. Anyway, the piece was voiced by a well-respected host, an actual IRL anchor of Panorama, Richard Dimbley. The spot teemed with facts about this unique harvest. Through his tones, we learned that deliberate and delightful details about the food, like how spaghetti was saved due to the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil. <laughs> Qu quote, the tiny creature whose depredations have caused much concern in the past. How an early frost doesn't necessarily kill the crop, it just lowers its values on the world market. That the puzzling uniform length of the spaghetti crop is, quote, results of many years of patient endeavor by plant breeders. Again, I remind you, this was on the BBC in a primetime news show, and it was filmed on location in Switzerland. The, they got together, they flew down, they brought in local girls in local dress, and only those who worked on it knew it was fake. The station boss was only alerted minutes before it went on the air. They tacked the segment after a very real piece on wine, and then no other person than Dimbley himself, the guy who voiced this spot, threw to it. Deadpan. And now, from wine to food, we end Panorama tonight with a special report from the Swiss Alps. <laughs> this happened. Eight million people estimated watched it. And it was produced so well that people took it at face value. <laughs> so depending on what you read, we're going to do a really brief background on April Fool's Day. A lot of people have very just things you should Google it and just deal with it. Was it the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar? Was it the Council of Trent? You know, those that didn't know they had to celebrate the new year in the spring because they were idiots. I don't know, arrival of fools, the... County Diary, I seriously have a big list here and it's boring. The Vernal Equinox, Roman's End of Winter Celebration, Hilaria, and something about paper fish placed on their back and called Poisson d'Avril, April fish. Poisson d'Avril, a young, easily hooked fish slash gullible human. April Fool's Day, like Purim, is a very interesting opportunity for us to disrupt the... <laughs> disrupt the natural order, flip off the powerful, and have a lie and a laugh with minimal consequence. A day of, as folklorist Nancy Castle McIntyre says, 
quote, symbolic inversion in which power relationships are upended and commonly held cultural codes, values, and norms are subver subverted. It's designed for us normals to let off some steam, not unlike the tragically underrated dystopic film, The Purge, only less machetes, I hope. And this trans tradition of trickery was embraced very early on in mass media. Yeah. Now, there's a long tradition of media companies using the occasion of April Fools as a way to generate interest in their publication. Hell, there's a long tradition of publications printing hoaxes not even on April Fools. In 1874, the New York Herald published a disturbing account of a great animal escape. Lurid, there was havoc, missing leopards, grizzly bears, Bengal tigers, African lions, prairie dogs, woodchucks, pink-footed geese, derby and wallaby, navigan, and iguanaco. And at the very end of the story, it read, of course, this is an entire fabrication. If you were here for my epidemic talk, these fucking guys put together a, a radio play featuring an alien invasion. And some folks, but not as many as initially reported if you were here for my talk, believed and or welcomed their alien overlords. Or they panicked, whatever. In 1977, the Guardian newspaper published a seven page insert on sans serif in the Indian Ocean. <laughs> A supplement chock full of information on the geography and culture of a made-up paradise. Delighting printing nerds the world over, as the section included reference to the islands of, and I'm going to butcher this title, don't judge me, Upper Cais, is that how you pronounce the font? Um, and Lower Cais, the capital of Bodini, and the leader, General Pika. People actually called the Guardian to see how they could vacation there. And finally, when Canada, my home and native land, introduced the $2 coin, a Canadian radio station told listeners that April 1st was the last day that they'd accept the $2, uh, sorry, the Canadian Treasury would accept $2 bills. Canadians called banks and the mint in a panic, thinking their money wouldn't be valid anymore. But have you ever heard of a house hippo? Wait, let's see if this plays. It's nighttime in a kitchen just like yours. All is quiet. Or is it? The North American house hippo is found throughout Canada and the eastern United States. <laughs> Canada has the best PSAs. And if you doubt me, I want you to go home tonight and Google, quote, don't you put it in your mouth, unquote, with safe search on. <laughs> and you'll find out what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> So this PSA aired during children's programming while I was growing up and a kid, and I loved this one. I loved the idea of these secret little tiny hippos running around the house because I wasn't allowed to have pets and it would have been great to have a hippo. But can I tell you a very quick story about myself? Thank you. Oh, such a supportive group. When I was in the sixth grade, my parents planned a trip to Cuba because that's what you do when you're from Canada. As a Christmas gift, I spent the months leading up to it learning about snorkeling and fish. I was from a landlocked city. It was the most exciting thing I was ever going to do. So the day arrived and my family started heading to the airport. I knew how to get to the airport because I'd been there before and I was carefully calculating how many hours until I was on the beach in this tropical paradise. But suddenly, my mom and dad said that we were going to be flying out of Edmonton, not Calgary. And my little anxious nerd brain went into overdrive because this is where I lived and this is where Edmonton is. And that's three hours away. <laughs> so after a few minutes, though, we turned into the airport road and my parents told me they were kidding. At which point I burst into tears and said to them, why would you lie to your daughter? <laughs> and yes, that story is on my therapy list. Which is to say, I fucking hate pranks. <laughs> no, I fucking hate them, really. I thought my parents were telling the truth. They were grown-ups, they were authority figures, and my young Amy brain had absolutely no reason not to believe. Which is to say, yes, I am a naive and trusting person, and pranks, especially those involving omissions of truth or lies, always hit me hard as a kid. I am not good at lying. And because I was never pranking, my trusting nature always got the better of me. And for pranks to work, there must be fools. 
During the 50s, British TV go goers could only access two channels, the BBC and ITV. Panorama was an actual news store. It was like 60 minutes. So there was a viewership of 10 million, and at this time, spaghetti and other Italian uh, meals were not common in, in Britain. So if you're thinking about it, this was the news, the place that millions of people got their information from. They had no reason to suspect it was a fake. And the BBC staffer Leonard Mile afterwards said that the calls came in incessantly, including one from Bristol who complained that spaghetti didn't grow vertically, but horizontally. <laughs> and one, that was a joke, but there was one call from a husband who said it must be true that they grew on trees because the BBC and Richard Dimbley said it, but the wife said it was made of flour and water, but they couldn't convince each other. So, those answering the phones just came to merely utter, place a sprig of spaghetti and a can of tomato sauce and hope for the best, which I'm sure was hilarious to those staffers, but sure didn't help any of those viewers. <laughs> so to our conversation before, pranks work best when punching up, upending the social order, allowing lies and disdain to flow upwards. But media pranks are different. M Media pranks, don't do it again, are not one person pranking one other person with a semi-equal footing of power. Media pranks come from one powerful entity and are shouted down, possibly on unsuspecting readers. Moira Smith said a significant note of pride in the achievement of the best media tricksters is the mockery of the anonymous fools. And not all readers appreciate being fooled, to which I say no shit. But pointed media hoaxes, thank you guys, you have not laughed at any of my fish jokes. <laughs> but pointed pranks can be done well. When I was prepping for this talk, I was having a conversation with my friend Colin, and I talked about how much I hated pranks, and that anyone who did enjoy pranks was mean, and I hated them, and they made me cry. But he brought the, the point up that, that when the media does it, it forces us to question who makes the media and why it's made. It draws attention to the medium and who we believe and why we believe them and he thinks that that makes for better media consumers. I argued that in the age of fake news, I don't think anyone's bothering to read the fine print. But his point does stand, and folklorists support it. And to go back to the house hippo, because of course I have to, here's an example of how to do it right. That looked really real, but you knew it couldn't be true, didn't you? That's why it's good to think about what you're watching on TV and ask questions, kind of like you just did. A message from Concerned Children's Advertisers. Hoaxes can teach. As long as we can get past the initial lull and aim for a full-on ROFL WPRML rolling on the floor laughing while promoting responsible media literacy. <laughs> Thank you. So, let us raise a toast. Let us raise a toast to the foolers and the fooled. May no prank have malice, but every prank have meaning. Thank you.